episode 116 of Australia's number one marketing show. Listen in as I chat with Mia Friedman, creator of Mamma Mia, Australia's most successful online women's community. We're talking 14 million monthly page views successful. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day, everyone, and welcome back to episode 116 of Australia's number one ranking small business marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid. You right there, if I'm not mistaken, are a motivated small business owner who wants to crank out some very good marketing. And we are brought to you by the very good folk at Net Registry who help get your business sorted online, whether it be AdWords, search engine optimization, domain hosting, website design development, you name it. They tick every online box imaginable. Net Registry, go to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.au, click on the banner on the right-hand side, and you will be taken to some exclusive listener packages. We love packages on this show. Now, guys, exciting show to crank the year up right from the very start. We have got Australia's biggest blogger to women, Mia Friedman. A little bit more on Mia in a minute. Just want to share a little bit about what I'm up to. I am right in the process over this holiday break, over this summer solace, updating the small business big marketing website. And I'm pretty excited about that because I haven't really given it a proper tickle in quite a long time. Months, maybe years, in fact. Um, It's had the occasional update, but um, well, this is going to be a significant departure from where the current site is at, and it's pretty exciting. I've been taking on um, a lot of the advice that people have given me over the last few months, and you know, when people ask a question, I kind of look at that question from, hey, it's a marketing question, but also it kind of gives me a sense of what they're thinking, what's on your marketing mind, and I'm making sure that I include those kind of things, those changes, those questions in the new update of the site. I thought I might share with you how I've gone about updating the site, what I'm using, what tools I'm using to update the site and and work with my web team to get this site rocking. So what I've done is I have written the copy in Google Docs um, because that's a beautifully collaborative way of doing it, simply creating the copy in Google Docs and sharing the link. So therefore, we can both be looking at it at the same time. There's only ever one master. You know, it's not like having a file, like a Word file living somewhere or a Pages file living somewhere. It's all in Google Docs. So that's where the copy is. And by the way, guys, if you are getting a website done, it is the content that always holds it up. It's generally not the web designer or the web developer. It is the content. And you, the web owner, the business owner, the marketer, are general, generally responsible for the content. So my copy is appearing. Uh, it's all in Google Docs. All the images, um, well, there's already a lot on the site. Um, any new ones I'm putting into Dropbox and sharing with my design team there. Um, I am then creating, I'm literally using my wife whiteboard to create wireframes, um, which is just, you know, wireframes being just a, a sketch outline of how I see each of the major pages looking. I then take a photo using my iPhone of each wireframe on my whiteboard and um, I upload that to my desktop. I then open Screener S-C-R-E-E-N-R.com, and I... A video that, what am I saying here? I video that wireframe that's sitting on my desktop and talk to it. And so therefore, I've created a little video that I can share with my web team to say, oh, you know, that box, that's the reason I've got that box here is this. I'd like to see this here, this, that, da, da, da. And they get a sense, they can hear me talk about my, my each wireframe for each page. I love screening because it's just a, it's an audio visual way of bringing your designs to life. I use it a lot for feedback as well. Um, I'm also using Podio, P-O-D-I-O, as the project management tool uh, for the team to communicate on. We all know exactly where things are at. You can upload files, you can upload pretty much anything, uh, and it keeps everyone on track and 
all those tools that I've just explained to you are F R double E. They are free. The the marketing world, it's a wonderful world, isn't it? There's so much good stuff out on the internet for free, including small business, big marketing. So, yeah, look, the website is in development. Um, I hope for it to go live sometime this month. So I'll keep you updated, but I just thought I'd share a couple of insights as to how I am going about... um, bringing it to life. I sort of started off as a bit of an, I said to the designer, it's going to be an evolution, not a revolution. I don't know. I don't know. These little small tweaks have become something much grander Um, and we'll see where it goes, but I'm pretty excited about it. What you can expect is it to be a one-stop shop like it already is for all things relating to small business marketing. That's really the intention of smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and it's only going to get better. One of the main parts of that website that I'm going to rock out of this planet is the products page because that's a place, it's it's the most visited part of my website alongside the podcast button and that's where I know you guys are looking for great training and great products that will allow you to do great marketing. So I'm going to be creating some over the course of the coming months. I already have created some and I'm the ones that I can't create, I am going to source from people who I trust. Okay, enough of that. I will keep you updated on the progress of that. Okay. Hey, don't forget guys, we are brought to you by netregistry.com.au and I partner with the Flying Solo Community, which is the largest community of solopreneurs in Australia. Go and check them out as well, flyingsolo.com.au. Now, let me read you Mir Friedman's bio because it is astounding and I am excited to have Mir on the show. So Mia is the editor and publisher of Australia's fastest growing women's website, right? MamaMia.com.au. But prior to that, she was the editor of Cosmopolitan, editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan, Cleo and Dolly. And she started Mamma Mia from a lounge room in 2007. And she is going to explain exactly how she did it and how she's growing it to the huge empire it is today. She employs, well, in her current bio that I'm reading, it says she employs 20 people and has 500,000 readers and 12 million page views per month. Those numbers have increased significantly and Mia is going to share the updated numbers with you. They are astounding. The the number of page views per month that she will share with you is mind-boggling. Give me 10% of them. It is all. Um, she's also got a national radio show off the back of Mamma Mia. She's a newspaper columnist. She also uh, presents on the Today Show, and she's written three books. Mia is a marketing machine, and I've got to tell you guys, Mia shares some marketing gold. There is one particular insight Mia shares in this interview called the emotional entry point. And I've got to tell you, I love it. It's one of the best marketing insights I've heard in recent times. And she gives a great example of how she used that in order to create great messaging. And you know how big I am on getting your message right before you worry about where to put it. So guys, seriously, grab a cuppa, Grab the nearest comfy chair, or if you're jogging or walking, whatever you do, keep doing that for the next half hour or 40 minutes or so. Pen and paper at the ready or Evernote open. Capture these ideas because they are dripping from the small business, big marketing HQ's ceiling in this interview. Here's Mia. Mia, welcome to Small Business, Big Marketing. Thanks for having me. Absolute joy having you at Small Business Big Marketing Headquarters. Now, in the spirit of honesty and transparency on this show, I got an email from your production manager early early today saying, can we push the interview back an hour? Because Mia, quote unquote, has an unexpected lunchtime meeting. Now, Mia, lunchtime meeting or boozy 1984 style lunch? Oh, my God. I, I didn't even have a boozy 1984 style lunch in 1984, hmm. probably because I was still at high school. But no, I um, will be completely honest and say I was grabbing a sandwich across the road with my brother, oh, who I have not you. seen for quite some time. Good on you. Family first, I say. Family first it was, yeah. Hey, now let's- I wanted to catch up with him before our family Christmas thing. Oh. Wow. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I think we should go there. Uh, plotting and planning. Is there some kind of um, lines in the sand being drawn and you're getting some, you know, what to say, what not to say in place? 
No, I think that just sometimes when it comes to your parents yep. and your family dynamics, only a sibling can understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, coming from a family of six. I yeah, hear you. sure. I hear you. I still don't know whether I'm going to. We're all going to see each other on Christmas Day anyway. You know, it's just like Every can't we? Family's bonkers. And it is. Not- person that will quite, in the, in the world that can quite understand how bonkers your family is, is your sibling, I think. Correct, correct. And uh, that's very important. Hey, Mia, now, this show, this show, this small business big marketing show, downloaded in 94 countries, inclu- including Kazakhstan. So there's a few people listening who just- Hello, Kazakhstan. Yeah, yeah, correct. Like, w- what are they doing listening anyway in the first place? Well, Good on them. It's. I'm kind of used to, I know a little bit about Kazakhstan because when I was editing Cosmo, Cosmo was in something like 64 countries in countries like Kazakhstan. There is a Kazakhstani Cosmo. Um, so every couple of years we'd all get together and all the editors from all the different countries would meet. So that was been a really interesting exercise in how you can take one brand and- and make it applicable in everywhere from Muslim countries to America. Have you been to Kazakhstan? Never. Oh, wow. Like um, I interviewed Brian Singer from Rip Curl and he's got a store there. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, what's that about? Not even a wave. There's not like there is not a wave in Kazakhstan as, as far as we That's know. That's fantastic. It is good. But, but the reason I say that is because not everyone listening will know of or understand this phenomenon called Mamma Mia. So can you well, explain it? Someone will probably wonder why we're talking about an ABBA song. <laughs> um, it, basically, when, you know, I've been involved in media my whole adult working life. I started in women's magazines when I was about 19 and worked in women's mags for about 15 years and then briefly um, had a disastrous flirtation with with, um, TV and then really found myself moving as a content provider, as a a content creator, which is what I consider myself. um, And as a consumer, I found myself being increasingly drawn to online because that just seemed to be where it was happening. It was able to react quickly. I liked the fact that it was very authentic. It wasn't sort of glossy and packaged and photoshopped. Um, And I suppose as I'd risen up through the ranks in magazines and media over my 15 years in in working for a big company, I'd gotten further and further away from what I love to do, which is communicate with an audience and create a community. So I started in 2000 and... um, what, 2007? Seven. I started just a blog. The name Mamma Mia, the domain name mamamia.com.au was available. Um, it was never going to be a mummy blog or, you know, Mamma Mia didn't refer to the fact that it was going to be a parenting site. It was more just a bit of an in joke and an ABBA song. Um, and I didn't really know even what it was going to be about. I knew I didn't want to write a mummy blog. I knew that I didn't just want to write a blog about myself. I didn't want it to be a fashion blog because I, I was interested in so many different things. So what it just became was what I, whatever I was interested in that day. And, um, you know, it, it went on to grow from there to now being going from a personal sort of blog to a women's website. And um, we now have... About 800,000 readers a month and um, we have something like 14 or 15 million page views a month and we also have a a sister website called ivillage.com.au which is, um, you know, slightly different to Mamma Mia, more parenting focused. And uh, so together they reach about 1.2 million women in Australia every month. That's insane. So, well, first of all, well done. And, Thank you. <laughs> you know, funny, you know, I guess you're coming from a magazine environment. But even magazines are single-minded. Like I've come from an advertising background and kind of got drummed into me from an early age about single-minded communication. So when I go to something like mamamia.com.au and look at it, I go, wow, there, there is so much there. I guess the single-mindedness of your, your site is that it's targeting women, and ev- yeah. everything women are interested in, yeah? Exactly. And and it was for a long time because at first it was just me and, and my husband would say, you know, what's your elevator pitch? What's Mamma Mia about? What's the tagline? And, you know, as a way to sort of challenge me. And, and I couldn't answer him. And for a long time I sort of mistakenly and, and he mistakenly assumed that that was its weakness, um, that, that you couldn't say what it was about in 140 characters. But... I came to realise and, and explain to him and, and understand myself that 
that was actually its strength because the way women talk is they talk about everything. So they will go from talking about gun control to talking about a celebrity who's just got divorced to talking about, um, you know, their pelvic floor after they have a baby to talking about feminism to talking about climate change. And that will probably be in the first five minutes and it doesn't matter whether they know each other or not. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's very, very different to the way men communicate, you know. And it's also was at the time and, and is still very different to the majority of websites out there that are directed at women because you have parenting sites, you have fashion sites, you have news sites, which the news sites tend to be very male dominated and, you know, absolute shit fights in terms of the level of commentary. Um, But I know as someone who is a parent and someone who's interested in fashion, interested in news, none of those, you know, all of those sites are too specialist for me. Mm Mm-hmm. So, so well, when you when you combined. when you were content creating in the early days, because now you've got a staff of how many? We've got a staff of about twenty five to thirty. Okay, so people, you've got twenty five to thirty people who are creating across. The, across uh, so go on. They're not all creating content. So we have about um, six or seven of us that are creating content. Okay, so you're, you've got people creating content in specific areas. But in the early days, were you the one farming the content? Were you creating it? Were you farming it, like getting it from other sources? Was it just you? Yeah, it was just me. So I was posting about <laughs> six times a day. Yeah. And the way we work now is, is um, and every post was from me. So I was creating 100% of the content. Now yep. we've got six full-time um, journalists on staff. We've got um, a couple that work part time, and then we have, and that accounts for probably seventy percent of our content, seventy five percent of our content, and the rest comes from contributions for everybody, from everybody, from the prime minister to um, a mother whose child may have drowned and, and wants to write about that experience to the opposition leader to a celebrity to anyone you could imagine who really want to access our platform and our community of engaged women. I love that. You've had the PM write for Mamma Mia? Yeah, she's come in a number of times. She's written quite a few times for us. She's come into the office to live blog with our readers a number of times. Um, Tony Abbott has written for the site quite a few times. Um, He keeps threatening to come in, but I think he's a little daunted. Um, And we've got you know, constantly we've got um, ministers, we've, we've got a post today by Tanya Plibersek um, calling out Tony Abbott about um, about something. So increasingly politicians are using Mamma Mia as a way of creating and not just talking to women but also as a way to listen to women. So Bill Shorten, for example, um, came and blogged about the budget and and came and answered reader questions about the budget. And we had Joe Hockey write a beautiful piece for us about how he really struggles with with um, not being around for his kids as much as he'd like yeah, to be. Yeah, wow. Oh, all sorts of things. Mia, I want to talk further about how you actually go about targeting women. I hate that word, targeting, but, you know, creating creating uh, marketing to women. But before we do that, um, I'm re- I think the idea of where this came from is so interesting. So in 2007, you're the editor-in-chief of Cosmo, Clio and Dolly magazines, and then at some point you go, you know what, no, I'm going to go and work from my lounge room. So you've gone from the, the corner office, mahogany, I don't know, mahogany, white child corner office to lounge <laughs> lounge room. Um, is that what happened? And Yeah, pretty what- much. I mean, I took a bit of a detour via Channel 9, which was just hellish for a whole <laughs> bunch of reasons. But um, that all came, you know, I was done with magazines. I was looking for my next challenge. I probably should have gone straight from magazines to this, but instead I sort of diverted. Um, with was the Channel re- 9 thing ego? Uh, my ego? Yeah, yeah, like you go, because you, you could be easy to go, oh, I've been wooed by a TV station where it's well, really, you know. That's interesting. That, yeah, for sure there was part of that. And also um, I, Ch- ACP wouldn't let me out of my contract because I was still signed. So they no. would let me move to Channel 9, but they wouldn't, you know, I was still contracted to them. So yep. um, they were not keen for me to go. So everyone in senior management at, at ACP at the time, at, at PBL, like from James Packer to John Alexander, they were all very supportive of me going over to Channel 9. Um, they really encouraged me. And I thought, look, it could be fun. Like I could, I've always thought TV was kind of interesting. Um 
you know, maybe it will be interesting to be on this roller coaster and I know that I'll be pushed out of my comfort zone. And after 15 years of being in the warm, estrogen soaked bosom of women's magazine, <laughs> I was kind of ready for something a bit different. But you know, you know what? I, I say, uh, as an observer, as a consumer of media, and the okay. reason I say ego before is like, I go, you know, when I see radio people get the TV show, never works. And yeah. what I'm hearing you, looking at you, your career, clearly was, you're, right. the, you're the print chick, you're the magazine chick, and you should, you know, that, that direct line straight into blogging just made so much sense. No, but And I'm a, fundamentally I'm a writer, so I'm not that interested in being an executive and walking around and, no. you know, and also the, the job I went to, I have to take responsibility for it. The job I went to didn't really exist. It was a very amorphous job. So I was stepping into a role that didn't really exist and there were a lot of people there who didn't really want me there and fair enough because I didn't have a lot of TV, you had no TV experience to offer. So look, they say that you have to have a really bad relationship before you recognize the right one. And I had to have this really bad job experience and career experience before I was forced to find the thing that was right for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it wasn't, it's not the trimmings and the, you know, the lack of a personal assistant and and not being invited to things anymore because none of that I was interested in anyway. I mean, it's nice, you know, I always got my own coffee and and sent my own emails, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't a problem. It was it was more the what's my identity because at first Mamma Mia wasn't anything and, and I'd always worked for a big media company and I'd enjoyed that and I'd enjoyed in working in a team um, and I didn't know what I was doing and I was working all by myself and I was working at home alone so it was very isolating. I was very, mm. you know, unsure of what I was doing. Um, I, I like being good at things so yeah. <laughs> having to start all over again and feeling that everything I'd worked for in my career for 15 years had sort of you know, gone up in smoke, which is what it felt at the time. That was really tough. Tell me, you're, you're in the lounge room. It's 2007. You've got the tracky dax on. You've made this big career change. Um, tell us about that. There must have been a moment where you've just, you've had the meltdown. You've gone, what have I done? Oh, there were many. Uh, there were many, but yes, it wasn't my choice. So I think that had I not, what I did next, of course, is that I fell accidentally pregnant. And had that not happened, I think that I was finding it so tough, I would have probably just desperately jumped back on the media merry-go-round and gone back to being some senior executive just mm-hmm. so I didn't have to push through this discomfort and reinvent myself. But as it was, I got pregnant, so I had to push through. You know, I, I, I and that ultimately ended up being a great thing. But yeah, totally. You know, I, I when I left ACP, I, I had sort of seventy five staff of about seventy five across the various um, magazines, and and I remember at one point sitting at home, pregnant, and I'd done some. It was when I was starting to to um, get commercial offers for the for the for the website and, and people, I was giving away movie tickets or something like that. And there'd been 10 readers who'd won movie tickets. And I was sitting there with my, at the time, three-year-old daughter, and she was helping me put stamps on envelopes so I could post out the winning tickets Brilliant. to the 10 readers. So, you know, it was really ultimately fantastic to get my hands completely dirty, building a small business. As anyone knows, you have to just do everything yourself. Yep. Yep. Um, tell me then. Okay, so at some point, some point, something must have happened. There was a, you know, the classic Malcolm Gladwell tipping point. What what happened? Where you've gone? Oh, hang on, hang on. We're onto something here. Traffic had started to grow. You know, about a year or two down the tracks, traffic had started to organically grow. I'd um, dipped my toe into the world of social media, so Twitter and Facebook. I was I was starting to understand how to use um, how to pull those social media levers to drive traffic back to the site and to increase engagement. Um, comments were going really well. I was starting to getting getting some approaches from people who wanted to advertise on the site. But it was still a personal blog. I was still providing 100% of the content myself and um, I just didn't have the time to explore anything. I was making no money. I was making like, I don't know, $5 a year on Google Ads or something like that. So my husband, who at the time um, was looking for his net, he'd sold the business that he was in around the time that I left um, PBL and, and, and started Mamma Mia. And so he'd spent a year or so doing a, a, a Harvard course and he was now just looking around for investments and he one day just sort of twigged to the fact that he was looking at these other companies to invest in and maybe there was a business opportunity in his lounge room. Oh, wow. And so he went, well, what if we give this a year and I try to monetize this business 
And if it doesn't work after a year, maybe it's time that you moved on to something else. Because I was working, you know, as you do, 16 hours a day, every day, working my guts out for absolutely no tangible benefit. So he came on and, and that was the tipping point for the business. So he really... I couldn't, I, I hadn't, as can often happen, I understand now when you're running a small business, you're so consumed in the day-to-day and on the treadmill that you don't have the time or the headspace to be strategic or to um, work out how to get the business to the next level. And that's not my forte anyway. Like I'm a content provider. It's what I love. I love content. I'm not interested, you know, the, the, the fastest way to get my eyes to glaze over is to say the word strategy. Yeah, I hear and I just want to cry, you know, but he had those skills. So he immediately took over the business side and the technical side and really spearheaded this transition from my personal blog to a women's website that was edited and published by me. And um, we've never looked back. So where'd the money go? Into into website development or bringing staff in uh, to create content on top of what you were creating? Where, where'd the money, the, that first 12 months of dough go? Yeah, no, he didn't invest anything but his time. Ah. So he didn't put in any money. He just, oh, we put in a little bit of money to rebuild the site. That's not true. We did put in a little bit of money to rebuild the site. But it was really just saying, okay, it was now two people working on this full time. Um, And that meant that we could move forward in leaps and bounds. So he knew that to monetize the site, we had to restructure it technically and we had to reposition it. So he identified um, that when you have a personal blog, you don't have an asset that can ever be sold. So, so much. I need a hubby like yours. <laughs> I, you know, I've been creating this show. I've been doing this show for three years. It's all mine. Like I am in my lounge room. Well, no, I'm not right now, but, you know, I, I have done it out of my lounge room. And, you know, I, I do love creating content. And, you know, I think so many of us are being held back by the fact that we're not adding people to the team, whether it be our hubbies or our wives or whoever it may be, to do the stuff that we're not good at. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I've always been, it's interesting, I've always been very, very clear about what I'm not good at and also just what I'm not interested in. Like I'm very, um, just very clear (laughs) and I tend to be not good at the stuff I'm not interested in. So that's so (laughs) cool. But, um, you know, having him spearhead that and we had to have some pretty tough conversations because it was things like, babe, you're the single point, you know, no business can have a single point of failure and you are the single point of failure of mum and me. Mm. It currently is. Mm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can, I can get that. <laughs> um, but when you're that close to it and you're that absorbed in the minutiae, it's really, really hard to, to make, those, um, make those calls yourself. Does your hubby call you babe in, in business meetings? Screaming through every new stage of the business. Does your hubby call you babe in business meetings? Yes, he oh, does. I love that. Oh, and it was really funny. We went to a meeting with um, some people who were doing some consulting work for us and it was like a briefing meeting on the site and, um, you know, we sort of got to the end and they said, oh, so, you know, how did you two come to be working together? <laughs> and then Jace went, we're married. <laughs> <laughs> I started oh, sleeping with her. And, and Jace goes, well, either our chemistry is really bad or we're really professional. <laughs> yeah, that's right, clearly. Or those people that you met with just have no intuition at all. And occasionally in a meeting I'll, like, reach over. <laughs> I'll reach over to give his hand a little squeeze or something. I did that the other day and, you know, half the staff nearly vomited. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Well, it must be testing. You know, there must be times when it you, you've got to have a strong relationship to also have a business relationship, I'm sure. Yeah, you do. And you've got to have very, very clear boundaries about I know what he's good at and where I completely relinquish control to him and, and vice versa. I think if we were, if we had the same skill set or we're trying to do the same thing, then we, we might clash. And we do still occasionally clash, but surprisingly infrequently. Like literally, we come to work separately. We work in different ends of the office. We often won't even see each other during the day. And, and we, you know, we go home separately and then often he'll come home and I'll be like, oh, how was your day? <laughs> Um, and, and it, you know, it does put pressure on your relationship, but at the same time, there's a lot of pressure on running a small business anyway. And I've got friends who have two small businesses running in the same family, you know, she's working on one and he's working on another. And that's far tougher because then you're not, you know, the, the businesses are competing with each other. 
Hey, Mia, when did the dough start coming in the door then? You talk about $5 in AdWords a year. Uh, that's not going to get you rich. So when did you, when did you realise that we figured out the way to monetize this bad boy? Well, it's funny. I think probably within... Again, I've got such – I was talking about not being interested in the things I don't care about. I'm just literally shut out. It's, it's the only way I can get through everything that I have to get through in a day. So I don't have a good handle on figures or numbers because I'm just – I'm a words person. I'm just not interested. Mm-hmm. But I figure, you know, obviously everything that came in, we, we, we reinvested into the business. But he seemed to – we became profitable within six, six months of him starting. Hmm. Six months. I mean, he he turned it around. And and what did he do? Did he go out and seek sponsors? Did he up the the Google AdWords presence? What did he do? The first thing he did. Well, at first he was quite daunted by not knowing a huge amount. I mean, he'd never worked in the media before, and obviously he'd never he'd done a bit of B two B. He'd been in the liquor industry before, and he'd he'd established a, a, a really good B two B website for his business. But he, you know, he was very daunted at first, and he it was really soon that he realised that. Because this is an online, is an digital, is an area that's moving so fast. You've just got to get on the train at whatever stop you're on, you know, because everybody's learning, and so you just jump on whenever you jump on, and everyone's learning as they go. Mm-hmm. And so he sort of picked up an enormous amount of knowledge in a really, really fast time, and that left me to just refine and and keep working on the content because I instinctively know how to create communities of women and I instinctively know how to create, how to engage women because I know how women like to communicate. Um, And so he was able, the first thing he did was to to, um, look at restructuring the site. So it wasn't just a blog role, it was more of a website. The second thing he did was appoint um, an ad network to sell our ad space, which is something that we did externally because we just weren't set up to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had to get our traffic to a certain point to be able to do that because the ad networks that that sell, you know, uh, on behalf of, of smaller websites, you have to have a, a, you know, a baseline level of traffic to make it worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a good way for us to start. And then obviously that was going to be untenable because um, – you want to be in control of your revenue and you don't want to be sharing it. So ultimately he knew that we needed to get our traffic to a point and our our revenue to a point where we could start building our own sales team, which is something we started doing about a year or two ago. Um, And yeah, we've just sort of gone from there. And then the other big, the, the other big, you know, turning point in our business was um, about 18 months ago, he became aware that that our traffic was good and it was growing really well. But if you looked at the list of um, top 10 women's websites in Australia, there were only two that were independent, i.e. not owned by Fairfax or News Limited or 9MSN or Yahoo. And that was Mamma Mia and an American website called Mm iVillage.com. And they're the biggest women's lifestyle website in the world. They're a little bit like the Women's Weekly meets Cosmo. They're kind of like they have lots of um, like a women's magazine. That's sort of you know food and parenting and cooking and shopping and craft and relationship stories and career stories and mm-hmm. all of that kind of stuff. And so he approached them and said, um, you know, explained who we were and just said we'd like to to in market sell your Australian eyeballs, which basically means that we would then be in market um, selling the Australian ad- advertising for their site. And they said, oh, well, that's a coincidence that you called because we're just about to come to Australia. We've decided we're launching uh, iVillage in Australia. We've already got iVillage in America and the UK and Canada. Australia is our next market that we want to come into and we're looking for a media partner to to do it with us. So we'll put you on our list of interviews when we're there. So they came and they met with all the big players, Channel 10, Fairfax News, 9, MSN, et cetera. And we were their last meeting and they said to us, you know, months later, we walked into that meeting with you guys going, oh, well, you know, clearly we're not launching in Australia because there was no one here that they were prepared to do business with. And we just hit it off and they really liked, the. they were really impressed with the way that we could demonstrate our level of engagement with our readers through comment numbers, through shares of posts and through social media interactions. And so we launched iVillage Australia about six months ago and what that did is that it meant we were then able to play with the big boys or rather girls. Mm. So, you know, small, big agencies. So if you're booking Toyota's advertising or Nissan's advertising or, um, you know, the government advertising, 
they won't want to deal with 10 small independent publishers. They only want to deal with a few big ones. So because we now have, we represent, you know, 1.2 million women in Australia every month, we can now then get on those schedules. What a great story. So did you buy into iVillage or were you, what's the relationship? We we uh, have a licensing agreement with right, them. Right, right. So, um, we pay, uh, you know, obviously for the for the um, for the license to publish iVillage in Australia, and we work very closely with them. Mia, you've spoken a lot about. Oh, by the way, listeners, I am talking to Mia Friedman, who's the creator of the mamamia.com.au phenomenon, and also iVillage.com.au. Yep. Now, Mia, you have spoken a lot about targeting women, marketing to women and building communities of women. And I know there's a lot of listeners who would love some insights into ways of marketing to women because it, it, it's different to blokes. Yeah, it is different to blokes. Um, it's really interesting. It's, it's something that I've had to sort of step out of myself and try to try to put it into words because a lot of what we do is kind of just instinctive. But um, the most important thing is authenticity and that was the reason that I was really moving away from magazines because I just felt that they weren't authentic. I felt that they were um, – sorry, that's just a boat. Um, <laughs> In your office? My yacht. No, Love not it. a ferry. Um, they were um, – magazines and lots of forms of media are don't communicate with women in authentic ways. And what Mamma Mia does is always, and the best thing when you're trying to communicate with women is to try to find an emotional entry point into something. And so I'll give you an example. So we had, um, there's an ad at the moment for a dishwashing tablet, a new dishwashing tablet, finished dishwashing tablet. And they have, they're running an ad with um, a blogger from Kidspot, which is like a parenting website. Mm -hmm. And it's got her in her kitchen, standing in front of her dishwasher going, you know, I've been using these finished dishwashing tablets and they are just so amazing and my dishes have never been so shiny and look at the shine and I just can't believe it and I'm going to tell all my friends about it and they won't even believe how shiny my dishes are. Is this an ad from 1953? That's exactly right. So <laughs> look at it and and Finish approached us a little while ago about this new dishwashing thing you know? and so what we don't just run display advertising, although we do. Something that we do that, that's incredibly popular is that we offer these social media packages, which is about integrating content and engaging. You know, you can't just flash an ad at a woman and expect her to engage with it. You've got to embed it in a conversation. So, you know, they came to us and they said, we've got this new dishwashing thing and it's got this new ingredient and it's going to do this. And we went, okay, well, that's all very interesting for you, but there's not a lot of – there's no emotional entry point into having shiny dishes. Like I don't know anyone who – if any friend of mine tried to tell me about a shiny dish, I'd call an ambulance. Yeah, you know? yeah. That ain't no friend of mine. So <laughs> what we said is, okay, let's talk about dishwashers. What's the emotional entry point of dishwashers? And we worked out it's in every household there is someone who is the dishwashing police. There's someone who knows the perfect way to stack a dishwasher. Yep. And they that's, are, that's me, by the way. So, you, you, you're ringing my bell here. So, immediately when when I tell that story, everyone will go, oh, yeah, that's me or, oh, that's my flatmate or that's, that, that's my husband. And and what it does is that it embeds this information about this new dishwashing thing in conversations about who's the dishwashing police in your house. And suddenly you have all these comments about, when people are engaged rather than just passively watching someone talk about their shiny dishes and some new ingredient. I mean, who cares about a new ingredient mm. in a dishwashing tablet? Um, it's how is this relevant to my life and how is this authentic? And that's what I love about online in that it enables you to um, talk directly and authentically to women about anything. So this um, concept, I love the concept, by the way, Mia, emotional entry point, which is like, so what? what's the process in at Mamma Mia HQ to find emotional entry points for brands? Do you sit around and talk about the product and then see where that conversation goes? And the conversation in, in the case of finished dishwashing liquid went to the fact that stacking the dishwasher is, you know, that's, what it, that's where it's at. Is that what you do? Exactly. So, um, you know, People also really like hearing real life stories. So we had, you know, life insurance come talk to us, and and we we were talking to this life insurance company about 
okay, what do women, what do most people do when they hear about life insurance and those ads for wills and funerals? You, first thing you do is really block your ears or change the channel because it's like, la, 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 la. Yeah. Talk about that. I don't want to think about that. It's too scary. So we sort of started to talk about, okay, so what are the issues around that? Is it, okay, income protection, what happens if someone in your life suddenly wasn't there? What would happen? And whether you find someone who that's happened to and you let them tell their story, um, you just encourage people. People love talking about themselves more than anything. Mm -hmm. So you really you really try to just talk. So a client might come to us with a dishwashing tablet or life insurance or a new drink that they launch or whatever it happens to be. And we will sort of, once we understand what they're trying to achieve, we will then come up with options for um, social media packages, which we then write in an editorial style, but always disclosed. And we then send out to our social media army, which is over 120,000 people. Because that's the other thing. You can't expect, I see so many people think that social media is about, I don't know, we'll just start a blog on our furniture store website. And it's like, no one is going to come. It is not a case of build it and they will come with, with online. You have to go to where the people are. And that's really key. So I encourage people to see social media as like, imagine if you've got a small business, just imagine you've got a farm and you're selling tomatoes and outside, you know, you'd go for those drives on country roads and there'll be a little stall outside someone's farm and it'll say, bag of tomatoes, leave $5 in this box. And, you know, the people that come to your house, so your friends and your relatives, they might buy some tomatoes from you. You'll get the occasional person who's lost and driving past your farm and they might buy some tomatoes. But if you're not also selling your tomatoes and telling people about your farm down at the local market, where everybody else is selling their wares and everyone in the community is going to buy their coffee and have their chats, then you don't have a hope, you know. You can't rely on people just wandering past. So if you look at that in terms of your website is that little stall outside your farm and social media is the grower's market where you want to be luring people back to your farm to buy more of your products. Fish where the fish are. Exactly. So, so you've got just to finish off that finished dishwashing liquid one because so what you identified was the 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 dishwasher stacking Nazi within the household. So what did, what did you do then? Did you go out onto Facebook and start a discussion around that? Who is that? You who who's the dishwasher stacking Nazi in your house? Post. So we wrote about about that. We, we wrote about it along with, um, we talked about, um, we used another, we used two hooks actually because the first hook was around the time of MasterChef when MasterChef was really big and we were saying, you know, it's awesome in, the, in MasterChef but who does the washing up and who stacks the dishwasher because can you imagine the, the dishwasher stacking after MasterChef? Yeah. So that had um, four and a half thousand samples to give away, not entire boxes but literally four and a half thousand individual dishwashing tablets. And, you know, we were sort of full of bravado and said to them, yeah, 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 that's fine. We can, we, we'll can, we give, give those away from you thinking, oh, my God, are we going to have boxes of them in our garage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we? And in actual fact, they were gone within 24 hours. There were dozens of comments. People would, were sharing things on their Facebook page and retweeting it. Um, so what did they have to do? Did they have to retweet or like or leave a comment in order to then receive a sample? were very advanced at all. All they had to do is um, sign up and, and put in their details. But people, even if they didn't get a free sample, they wanted to engage on that post mm. and talk about their dishwashers. It sounds hilarious, mm. but everyone wanted to share the story of the dishwashing Nazi in their house. Or the and then there were these threads that were going on about this is the correct way to stack the dishwasher is a up, is facing down. What do we think about trays at the top of the dishwasher? Like... It was really interesting, and you should never underestimate the things people are interested in talking about. Ab- absolutely not. And and coming from a magazine background like you have, I mean, you'd know that. I mean, some of the most superficial kind of conversations are the ones that get the most traction, the, mo- the articles that talk about yeah. nothing in particular, you know, fill our days. <laughs> Problem with old media because you wouldn't know and advertisers wouldn't know because yeah. it's not a two-way conversation. It's just a monologue. And that's what traditional advertising is and that's what old media is. It's just a monologue. It's someone standing up on a stage with a megaphone telling you stuff. Um, but what women, de- what women not just expect but demand is a conversation. So when we write a post, whether it's a sponsored post for a product or, you know, something from the Prime Minister, that's just a starting off point. It's not 
the end finished full stop. It's like, okay, so what do you think? Mm. And, you know, women love to talk. They love to exchange information. They love to say what they think about things. It's how they, often it's how they work out what they think about things by reading what other people think. A mate of mine is the professor of marketing at a university, Mir, and he has uh, identified a study that proves that women have 7,000 words to use every day and men have 4,000. I would have thought those numbers would be even further apart, actually. I, I agree. In fact, I would have thought that the women's number would be higher and the men's number would be lower because I don't know whether a grunt is considered a word these days. But anyway, that's interesting in itself. Well, now I understand why, you know, women need so much information because you talk so much, so you chew through it. <laughs> correct, correct. Mia, this is gold. I know you, uh, you're busy. I've got a couple of questions left, but thank you so much for sharing what, what so far has been. There is marketing gold dripping from the ceiling of small business, big marketing HQ, let me tell you. Um, now, we've talked about targeting women. I love that emotional entry point. Building community, I think that's all part of it. Is, is Mama Mia, um, is it always going to be just the written word or are you looking to this content creation going into you're going to be have a podcast is there video what else well we were approached um about a year and a half ago by sky news with the with the view of turning it into a, a weekly tv show which we did for about six months and you know i don't think it set the world on fire but more to the point i didn't really enjoy it i didn't feel that it was a natural extension of what we did because we had sort of people sitting around talking about things, but again, it was a little bit one-way traffic. Uh, and then about six or nine months ago, we got approached by Osterio to um, do Mamma Mia as a radio show. They were looking for a new um, afternoon radio show to target it at women. And that has been such an example of just a perfect um, synergy. This sounds wanky, but um, radio has so much in common with what we do because it, there's no barrier between you and the audience. People, there's talk back, which is the same as comments. Um, it's opinion, so you throw things back and forth. And what's been great is that we've been able to tackle the diversity of content. So you can have a really lighthearted conversation about, um, you know, Brazilians and, and men getting taxes, <laughs> and then you can have a conversation about gun control or about um, – you know, a particular ad and whether it's racist or whatever mm. it happens to be. And, um, you know, I love that that it can go that gamut, that light and shade, because that's that's really how women communicate. And women like to feel things. That's the other thing you've got to remember when you're communicating with women. Women like to feel things. What do you mean? Like to live at the at, – at, you know, it's interesting. When a woman is moved by something – she will say, I'm crying or I am in tears. Mm -hmm. Even if she's not, she'll say that so that you know that you've affected her with whatever it is that you said or whatever it is that you've written. Um, we'll have that a lot. So if, if someone writes a really moving post, people will just, a lot of the comments will be people just saying, I'm crying right now. Right. And that's not a bad thing. Like, I heard you go, what do you mean? What do you yeah, mean? Yeah. What do you mean? And I'm not saying you necessarily want that if you're trying to sell a product, but in terms of, of women feeling emotion, they feel that that's a really positive, they'll, they'll go that this is amazing and they'll share something that's made them cry. Yeah, okay. And well, and we often on the show talk about branding, you know, every business, you, 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 you earn the idea of, build, you earn a brand. You don't just buy a brand, but you earn a brand if you're a marketer. And it's all about getting that emotional attachment, that a connection between you and your audience. Absolutely. In, in fact, Sam um, Sam Kavanagh, who introduced you and I, he is uh, he's one of the producers at Osterio. He's coming up on a, a future episode of Small Business Big Marketing, and he's talking about this whole concept of taking turning your listeners into fans, or actually not turning them, but treating your listeners as fans. Which, once again, it's all about emotion, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Mia, me, me, tell me, um, Mamma Mia. It's a phenomenon. What are you most proud of, of everything you've done within it since 2007? What, what's that one thing where every now and then you get to look back at, at, at it and go and cross your arms and go, hmm, love that? Look, as most small businesses, 
the small business owners will will tell you there's not a lot of back padding to be done when you're running a small business. In fact, that actually almost never happens because you're always just aware of the eight million things that you haven't done yep. rather than the two or three ones that you're proud of. I suppose if I'm forced to sort of step back and look look at it from the outside, having the Prime Minister come in here sort of twice in, in two months was pretty awesome. I got quite overexcited and invited all my family in to meet her like as if it was my wedding or something, <laughs> but my kids' friends and <laughs> everyone came and met the PM. So that was pretty, that was pretty awesome. I'm pretty, I'm really proud of the, um, the sort of the advocacy and the activism work that we do in terms of agitating around, um, you know, um, Against there's an organisation that that works actively to to not have children immunised. So we do a lot of pro immunisation stuff, pro vaccination stuff. Um, you know, to, but really, get, what I'm most proud of is giving uh, having a platform that enables people who would otherwise never reach the, the audience that we provide, and just letting them tell their stories. And that's not the prime minister. That might be someone who's had a stillborn baby, or someone whose partner has a chronic illness or someone, um, you know, who has recovered from an eating disorder or whatever it happens to be or who, who's fought, who, who's triumphed over bullies or whatever it happens to be, to just allow them to tell their story. So and how do you allow them? Do you get them, do, do they approach you and say, hey, I'd like to write a guest post or what? what how do you allow them? Yeah, they do now. Occasionally we approach someone and say, do you want to write, you know, but but we get hundreds of, of con- contributions a week and we can't use them all, of course. But, um, you know, we had a we had a family approach us with, they had a, a, this woman had a brother who was a missing person and he's been missing for a long time and um, a number of years and, and they wrote a post about him and the fact that he was missing and, that we published it on Mama Mia and, and it was shared hundreds and thousands of times actually over Facebook and it resulted in a confirmed sighting of him somewhere that was the first sort of bit of hope they've had in years. We had someone else who wrote a letter to her sister on what should have been her 26th birthday but she died the year before and, you know, just to watch people because writing can be very cathartic and for women sharing stories and, and talking can be very cathartic. So, to write and then to have all the comments and people really either saying, I know what you've been through or I've been through something similar or you've really touched me or, you know, thank you so much for helping me to feel like I know that little boy a little bit better that you lost. That to me is what I'm most proud of. Well done. Well done. I've got nothing more to add to that. (laughs) You got any questions? (laughs) That's wonderful, you know. (laughs) You should be very proud of that. Pat on the back for Mia Friedman. That's great. And just that, you know, for us to, to be able to give people that opportunity. It sounds really Pollyanna, doesn't it? But um, that's well, been all. It's awesome. Mia Friedman, thanks so much for um, for sharing the marketing love on Small Business Big Marketing. Oh, I can't wait to get a bit of marketing love back. I'm going to be listening and taking notes. It'll be coming through loud and clear. Thanks so much, Mia. Thanks, Tim. See you. See you later. Bye. What about that? Thank you, Mia Friedman, for absolute marketing gold. I hope you enjoyed that, listeners, as much as I did bringing it to you. And there are lots more interviews like that coming your way over the coming weeks and months. If you're not already subscribed to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, if you want to be the first in the know, go over there and register your interest in being on the list because you are going to be the first to know every time a new interview comes out, a new training product comes out, it's all about turbocharging your small businesses marketing. That's what this show is all about. In the weeks to come, I've got Sam Kavanagh, who is the national executive producer of some of the biggest radio programs in the country. He talks about taking our listeners, his listeners, and we can apply this to our business, going from listeners to raving fans. We want raving fans in our businesses. I've got a fantastic um, owner of a bed and breakfast who is doing some great things with his marketing. I've got a public speaking professional coming into the studio to share some insights into how we can all 
get up on the stage and build a bigger and better business um, and lots more to come, guys. So um, that's it for now. Hey, if you want to be part of the Small Business Big Marketing Mastermind, which I lovingly call the Deep Dive Mastermind, head over to deepdivemastermind.com, register your interest. Um, there is another intake coming up. The first group is closed at the moment, but there is another intake coming up shortly, and that's where we sit around a virtual table with me every week via webinar and belt it out, belt out some marketing goodness for your business, laser targeted your business. Enough of that. Until next time, may your marketing be the best marketing going around. See you next week. Bye. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.